Hey everybody, welcome to day three of the Acoria Lair of Behemoth set review on the Mana Leak. I'm John, as always, and today we're going to be taking a look at all of the black cards in the set from, of course, a limited perspective. We're not talking constructed. We have uh, 30 some odd cards, 34 or so to go over here, so we're going to get started. As a bit of a heads up, the uh, the gold slash rest of the set review that'll be coming on Tuesday will be long very long. There's double the cards in gold slash hybrid slash artifact slash lands, so it might be a little bit longer. Uh, be prepared. But we're going to get started in black with Bastion of Remembrance. Bastion of Remembrance is two and a black for an enchantment at uncommon. When Bastion of Remembrance enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. Whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So this is three mana for a 1-1 blood artist. But if your 1-1 dies, you still have the Blood Artist ability. I'm intrigued. I would definitely want to see a bunch of sacrifice outlets to really go off with this. Um, I definitely don't think you're going to be really getting there that much if your plan is to have your opponent kill your creatures off. It'll be a nice upside, but I don't know if I want to play a 3-mana 1-1 just for that ability maybe it's okay for that ability maybe maybe with that idea without other sacrifice outlets it's kind of like a a c minus a c minus we'll say now when we look at the rest of the set we try to figure out if there are a bunch of sacrifice outlets this looks like the traditional magic set where they make black red sacrifice and they only give you like two ways of doing it so there's not actually a deck there you'd have to be relatively lucky with your draft to really truly actually make the black red sacrifice deck we'll see uh, a couple of the black cards in the in this coming set review one very shortly and then red has a single mildly expensive way of sacrificing so i don't think the black red sack deck is really going to get there so i don't think you're going to play this and start playing aristocrats in limited so I think I am going to keep this at around the sort of C range. Uh, it's going to read well. People are going to think about how many of their creatures are going to die constantly and not realize that if that's happening, you're probably dead, uh, even though you've gained a little bit of life. So be careful with this. Don't overrate it. Blood Artist is amazing because of Constructed and because of what you can do when you bring together all of the great sack outlets from Magic's history. Uh, when you have to deal with just the sack outlets available in your draft or in your sealed pool, it's, it's worse. C for Bastion of Remembrance. Up next is Blitz Leech. Blitz Leech is five and a black for a card that the art looks like one of the showcase comic book arts. It does not look like magic art. Uh, anyways, it's a creature leech at common. It's a 5-2 with flash. When Blitz Leech enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. Remove all counters from that creature. Go back up to the top. This is a 6 drop. This is 5 and a black with no cycling. This seems very bad. I do not want to be stuck with a 6 drop in my hand that I'm just not going to get to cast. It's going to act like removal sort of only in combat because 5 should kill whatever it needs to kill but also will almost guaranteed die itself with only 2 toughness and minus 2 minus 2 this late in the game just doesn't seem as impactful either I think Blitzleech looks pretty bad I don't think I ever want to put this in my deck uh, so I'm going to start it at like a D it just seems real bad up next is a card that is not real bad, Blood Curdle. Blood Curdle is three and a black for an instant at common. Destroy target creature, put a menace counter on a creature you control. That's right. This is Impale. This is Eviscerate at instant speed, and you get a menace counter, and it's three and a black instead of two black black like uh, uh, Impale was. This is fantastic removal. This is first pick in probably every single pack it exists in that does not have one of the top 10 bombs of the format in it. Um, amazing card here you'll play every single copy you can you will first pick this you will second pick it if it gets passed to you and you are probably never going to see this third pick um, this format has mana fixing so you should be splashing this card it is fantastic it is a solid 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 a a for blood curdle up next is boot nipper Boot Nipper is one and a blue for a creature beast at common. It's a 2-1. Boot Nipper enters the battlefield with your choice of 
a death touch counter or a lifelink counter on it. So this is a, uh, a piker with death touch, which is fine. Um, you know, I, I say this all the time. I prefer my death touchers to be one ones for one, not two twos for two or two ones for two or whatever. And a lifelinker is super mediocre here. In a vacuum, this card is kind of like a, a C, I would say. I don't think it goes up into the C plus range. Lifelink or Death Touch will be a decent uh, 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 mutate platform, but it's also not something that I'm going to be super stoked about. I think this just sits in the C range. Up next is Bushmeat Poacher. Bushmeat Poacher is three and a black for a creature human soldier at common. It's a two four with pay one and tap it, sacrifice another creature. You gain life equal to that creature's toughness and you draw a card. This is almost a great sack outlet. One single mana and you gain some life and you draw a card is fantastic, super fantastic. But you have to tap it which means you're only doing it one a turn. And this is a great reason why I don't think the Aristocrats deck is actually going to be a thing in limited. You would need a ton of these. You would need to have a ton of these on the battlefield to really start getting that Aristocrats feel of multiple sacks per turn. Still, it's uh, not too much of a... Uh investment to really go off with this. I think I'd play it in every black deck, even if I wasn't going to be explicitly taking advantage of my graveyard or, or things like that. Just the fact that I can pay one to throw away a creature, draw a card and gain some life is totally fine. I think I'm very happy with Bushmeat Poacher in almost all black decks. I think she's a, a pretty decent C+. Up next is Call of the Death Dweller. Call of the Death Dweller is two and a black for a sorcery at Uncommon. Return up to two target creature cards with total converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. There's a lot of graveyard to battlefield stuff in this set. There's a lot of hand to battlefield stuff in this set. There's a lot of library to battlefield stuff in this set. At some point, we're just not going to be casting creatures anymore. We're just going to be putting them in for free. Anyways, this card seems okay. Um... The downside of these cards are always that you have to have targets. If you don't have targets, the card's dead. You literally cannot play it. And if the card doesn't have targets that are worthwhile, you can play it, but it's not going to be that good. Um, so Call of the Death, Dwell Death Dweller, at least it only costs three mana and getting back a uh, total CMC of three means that you are getting what you are paying. It's not like you're paying six mana and having to bring back a three, three drop because that's all you have in your graveyard. But yeah, the fact that these are so often dead in your hand because there's just not a target always make me hesitate a little bit. They always make me knock the grade down just a little bit from where people might put it. I'm going to put this at around a C plus though. There are ways to get stuff into your graveyard. We've already seen a sack outlet. There are cards that specifically mill yourself. Black green is all about getting your stuff in your graveyard and then getting it back out. And this is going to work well for that. So if you have ways of ensuring that stuff is going in your graveyard, I think this is a strong C plus you're still just getting back three drops or a two drop and a one drop or three one drops or something or sorry up to two target creatures so you'd only get two one drops um so you're not getting crazy stuff you're not bringing back bombs or anything but i think it can still be a strong c plus in that deck if you're not reliably filling your graveyard up i think you can probably just keep this near side up next is Cavern Whisperer. Cavern Whisperer is four and a black for a creature nightmare at common. It's a four, four with menace. Whenever this creature mutates, each opponent discards a card. You can mutate it for three and a black. I'm not super sold on this one. It's definitely one of the weaker mutate cards, I think. A 4-4 Menace for 5 is not something I'm terribly excited about. A 4-4 Menace for 4, eh, it's fine. That's decent. Depends on uh, just how good of a creature I'm sacrificing to uh, get this on top of it. Making my opponent discard a card, I mean, I guess that's gravy, but I'm not going out of my way to do that. This just feels like a C, feels like a C mutate card. I'm not super stoked to play it. C for Cavern Whisperer. Up next is Chittering Harvester. Chittering Harvester is five and a black for a creature nightmare. It's an uncommon. It's a four six. Whenever this creature mutates, each opponent sacrifices a creature. Mutate four and a black. This seems a little bit better, but it's definitely not for Rika's spawn. Uh, a four six for five. My opponent's probably going to have something that they can sack decently, and then you have to keep mutating onto this one creature to keep your opponent sacrificing, which is definitely very all in. You might be, uh, you know, assaulting their board and dwindling their board down, but then they find their removal spell and you lose all of the cards that you put into this as well. So I'm curious to see how this will play out. I think it's going to be totally fine. I think that first mutate is going to be good. I don't know that I want to be going deep on the mutates though. And at least unlike a normal edict, you have a four six left over, which is not too bad. So yeah, I think this is probably around like the strong C plus. I don't 
no, if I'll go to a B minus for this, maybe I'll go to a B minus. We'll see how it ends up. Let's start at a C plus for Chittering Harvester. Up next is Corpse Churn. Corpse Churn is one in a black for an instant at common. Put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So I historically don't like these effects if they are only returning one thing, if they are not cheap, or if they are not instant speed. This is instant speed. It's not the cheapest. I prefer them to be one mana. I think my favorite of these is still the one that returned a pirate and a non-pirate or whatever it was from Ixalan, but I think this is still totally fine. Two mana, instant speed, bring back a creature to your hand is going to be relevant at a significant portion of the game. And you get three more creatures into your graveyard from, or you get three more cards from your top of your library into your graveyard, which may fill it up with more creatures. It may give you a better option than you were originally going to do, or it may fill up for uh, uh, future shenanigans based on whatever uh, you were going to take originally. Be aware you're not targeting anything, so your opponent can't really exactly blow you out on this. If they are confident of what you're going to take based on what's already in your graveyard, they could exile it in response if there's anything in this format that actually does that um, but they're not going to know what the top three cards are until after they've had a chance to respond once that happens it's all on you to do whatever you want um, so yeah I think this card's around like a strong C I don't think you're going out of your way to play it but I think in black green especially if you're filling up your graveyard or want to fill up your graveyard it's going to be even a, a C plus there up next is Dark Bargain. Good old Dark Bargain from uh, Dominaria. Dark Bargain is three and a black for an instant at common. Look at the top three cards of your library. Put two of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. Dark Bargain deals two damage to you. So Dark Bargain from Dominaria, four mana was always just a little bit expensive, but it was instant speed and it did draw you two of your top three cards. It dealt two to you, but that was never that big of a deal. The card ultimately wasn't amazing. I, I had hoped that it was going to be a very good card, but four mana was a little bit of a detriment there. And I think four mana is going to be a little bit of a detriment here as well. Getting to fill your graveyard's nice, but you're probably just going to want to draw whatever you're going to be reanimating because you can at least play it the first time and then reanimate it again if it does die. Um, so yeah, Dark Bargain's probably going to have a place. It's probably going to be okay. You're not going to go in multiples, and I think it's just going to sit around the C level. Up next is Deadweight with, again, art that just doesn't fit. Dead Weight is a single black mana for an enchantment or a common enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets minus two, minus two. We know Dead Weight. We've seen Dead Weight as recently as Guilds of Ravnica, I think. I don't think it was Ravnica. Yeah, it was Guilds of Ravnica. Um, Dead Weight's always been fine, and I'm pretty sure it will be fine here as well. Yes, this is the Lair of Behemoths, but there's still a whole lot that this can kill, especially the Aura platform or the uh, the, the Mutate platforms before they get mutated onto. So I think Dead Weight's going to have a place. I don't think it's going to be quite as good as it has been in previous sets, but I still, still think it's going to be pretty decent and in the uh, the C plus range for sure. C plus for Deadweight. Up next is Dirge Bat. Dirge Bat is two black black for a creature bat at rare. It's a 3-3 three, three with flash and flying and whenever this creature mutates, destroy target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls, mutate for four black black. Quite a uh, more expensive casting cost on this one for the mutate side. Obviously, you're going to play this as a 3-3 three, three flash flyer on four if it makes sense. If you are just going to go for the throat, it's going to be the best thing you can possibly do. Why bother waiting till six mana? But top decking this later in the game and just having a removal spell that also is a 3-3 flyer with other abilities depending on what you mutated onto is going to be great as well. This is a first pick, a pretty clear first pick. I don't think it goes into the bomb range, so I don't think we're going to give it an A, but I think we can give it an A minus. If it was cheaper, I think we'd go A. Uh, very, very good Dirge Bat first pick for sure. Up next is Durable Coil Bug. Durable Coil Bug is one in a black for a creature insect at common. It's a 2-2, pay four in a black, return Durable Coil Bug from your graveyard to your hand. No, just no. It's a vanilla 2-2 um, until it's in your graveyard, which is super unimpactful these days. If you really need a mutate platform, I guess this is an option, but play better cards. Don't play bad cards to mutate onto them. And then if you find yourself in a situation where your 2-2 is dying and you have five mana to spend on only returning this to your hand rather than doing anything else and then another two mana to cast it, I, I don't know what game you're in, but I don't feel like it's a game that happens too, too often. Durable Coil Bug looks really mediocre to me. It's a C minus. I expect I just won't play this ever. 
Up next is Duskfang Mentor. Duskfang Mentor is two and a black for a creature human cleric at Uncommon. She's a 1-3. When Duskfang Mentor enters the battlefield, put a lifelink counter on target non-human creature you control. I've forgotten to, I've forgot that part in the last couple of reviews on this cycle. They cannot target themselves, which does make that white one a little bit less good than I thought. Um, pay one and a black, tap it, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control with lifelink. So a three mana 1-3 uh, you you obviously must have something that you can put a counter on, otherwise this card is terrible. But if you do, then putting lifelink on something is fine, and then being able to give it more counters is decent as well. I'm really going to have to play with these Duskfang Mentors because I'm having a bit of trouble visualizing the exact play pattern to make them go. So you're going to play the, this card and give something lifelink. And then this card cannot do anything. It can block two twos, I suppose, or one ones or whatever. Um, but it cannot attack because if it attacks, then you're not going to be able to tap it and get that uh, special, special, important counter on your lifelink creatures. Which feels weird because it almost makes this mentor feel more like an enchantment more than an actual creature. I guess the blocking makes it a creature. So I'm going to have to play with these cards to get a real handle. I think they're obviously build arounds and I think the ones that uh, have the most available mechanic keywords, so that's going to be the flying one and the trample one, are the ones that I'm most excited about. There's just less lifelink than there is flying or trample and so there's going to be less creatures that this is going to be able to go off on. Since I've been giving numbers all week, I may as well give numbers for this as well. There are 10 creatures that, uh, uh, or sorry, 10 cards that could uh, get or grant lifelink, and four of them are mythic or rare. So there is just not that much lifelink kicking around. So I don't think you're going to be going off with this. If you do, you're winning. Um, but yeah, I don't think this is that amazing. I think it's just going to be around a C plus. I think I like the flying one and the trample one way, 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 way more. Up next is Easy Prey. Easy Prey is one in a black for an instant at uncommon. Destroy target creature with converted mana cost two or less. Cycling for two. I think Easy Prey is totally fine. I think it's going to be underrated because, of course, this is the behemoths. We are going to be talking about the behemoths. There's a behemoth in the art here that's going to kill this guy killing the Easy Prey. Although I guess the joke here is that the guy killing the Easy Prey is the Easy Prey for the behemoth. But we've had this card before. It was called Defeat. It did not have cycling and it was sorcery speed. It was in uh, a set with Morph, which made it very good because there were a lot of tutus kicking around and those tutus had value as well. Easy Prey, I think, is still going to be totally fine. There are going to be two casting cost creatures kicking around that you're going to want to kill. Instant speed is really nice. You could get obviously not the blowout of mutate but you could at least deny the mutate plan and have them still get the creature um, I, I think this card is just going to be totally fine and if you find it not being fine it has cycling so i think this should be played in every single deck i think it should be you know not a not an unconditional removal pick so we're not talking pick one two three but i think pick four i'm pretty happy to pick up an easy prey i think people are going to undervalue this i think you're going to be able to get it a little bit late at the start of the format and i think you should always be playing it and probably just every copy of it it's not uncommon so you're only going to see on average one per draft uh, but i would play a second one for sure uh this is just a b i think uh, let's go b minus b minus for easy prey up next is Extinction Event. Extinction Event is three and a black for a sorcery at rare. Choose odd or even. Exile each creature with converted mana cost of the chosen value. Remember that zero is even. I do not really care for this card at all. It's one of those cards that's just utterly out of your control. You don't really get to control if your board is going to be all odd and your opponent's board is going to be all even. You know, uh, average magic, it's going to be a mixture. There's going to be odd and even, which means this is not going to be a wrath. It's going to pick things at random, essentially. Now, obviously, you get to choose when to cast it, and you're not going to cast it if it's going to, you know, hurt you more than it'll hurt your opponent, depending on which one you choose. But if you're not casting it, you're not doing anything with it and it's just a dead card in your hand so i'm just super not a fan of this it's too variable as to what it's actually going to do game to game moment to moment so i'm super out on it i've got it at a d i just don't really want to play extinction event you know i think people are going to say but you know enough times you'll be able to pick even and it will be better for you i'll be able to pick odd and it'll be better for you but I just feel like there is literally no control over that and I'm not going to put a card in my deck that I can't do anything with some amount of the time. So I'm out on Extinction Event, I've got it at a D, I just don't want to play it. 
Up next is Gloom Pangolin. Gloom Pangolin is two and a black for a creature Nightmare Pangolin at common. It's a 1-5 with flavor text. Uh, yeah, it's not good. It's not good at all. I wouldn't consider this a, uh, a, a mutate platform because I feel like I want my mutate creatures to be uh, tacky. I don't want them to be 1-5s. Maybe if you're going to be doing like the multiple mutate, but that feels like a gamble to me. This is a three drop. I think I want my, 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 my mutate platforms to be ones or twos more than I want them to be threes. So I don't know. I think Gloom Pangolin's like a D. I, I don't know that it'll have a place. Maybe you just really want a blocker and this is what you can do if you're a very controlling deck. I'll keep an eye on it for that. It could go up to like a C in those explicit specific decks, but as is, I'm gonna put a D for Gloom Pangolin. Up next is Grim Dancer. Grim Dancer is one black black for a creature nightmare on uncommon. It's a 3-3. Grim Dancer enters the battlefield with your choice of two different counters on it from among Menace, Death Touch, and Lifelink. Grim Dancer looks amazing. 3-3 three, three for 3 is obviously already passing the vanilla test, and it's going to be a Menace Death Touch or a Menace Lifelink or a Death Touch Lifelink. Seems fantastic. I see a lot of people saying Menace Death Touch is the best choice because it kills two creatures. Remember, your opponent is a living, breathing person who gets to make a choice in that matter. And if their two creatures are important enough, they can just not block. You know, sure, your opponent has two six sixes, and if they block, you get to kill them both, but they're just not going to do that. Now, if they don't, they're taking three, and perhaps eventually that will kill them, but if it's not going to kill them, they're not going to do it. So I don't actually think Menace Death Touch is the best option. I think Menace Lifelink is the best, best option because a six point life swing is huge. If you're dealing three and gaining three, that's going to put games out of reach very, very, very quickly. And they are going to have to put two creatures in front to stop it. So I think uh, Grim Dancer looks amazing regardless of what you choose. Menace Death Touch is fine. It's not bad. It's not bad to choose that. It's not bad to choose Death Touch Lifelink, although I think that is the worst choice by far. Um, but I think I'm going to be on Menace Lifelink on this more than I'm going to be Menace Death Touch. And I think it's going to be fantastic. I think it, it is is a strong strong b b seems high for this but it is very good let's go b minus b minus for grim dancer very 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 good up next is heartless act heartless act is one in a black for an instant at uncommon choose one destroy target creature with no counters on it or remove up to three counters from target creature this card looks amazing i think people may undervalue it to start because they'll say oh there's counters everywhere there's all the mechanic counters etc but this is going to be unconditional instant speed two mana removal that's called doom blade even doom blade had a condition on it doom blade was non-black this card seems fantastic. It should be first pick in, I think, most packs that it's in that, again, don't have a top 10 bomb. If we're looking at this versus uh, Blood Curdle, I think I'm on Blood Curdle just because Blood Curdle is truly unconditional, even though it's twice the cost, but this would be right behind. I think this is a very strong card. I think it's a strong B+. It's just fantastic. You're going to be killing something the vast majority of the time. The removing counters, I think, is going to be very rare to use, but it's super good. Strong B+, for Heartless Act. Do not undervalue this. Up next is Hunted Nightmare. Hunted Nightmare is one black black for a creature nightmare at rare. It's a 4-5 with Menace. When Hunted Nightmare enters the battlefield, target opponent puts a death touch counter on a creature they control. That That's that's right. It's a 3 mana 4-5 Menace. That's fair, right? My opponent does get a death touch creature if they have a creature on the battlefield. If this is on turn three, our opponent might not have played a creature yet. That That's entirely possible. How many limited games of magic have you not played anything until turn three? Or your opponent not played anything until turn three? This is going to be a nightmare when this comes down on turn three and your opponent doesn't have a creature. And then even if they do, they're going to have to have multiple creatures to be able to block this. If you remove that death touch creature, then they lost their value. This card seems nutty, seems super undercosted, very good, very easy to get around the downside that it has, even though it is nice to see a creature with a downside. We don't see that very often anymore, um, but it, it has to have a downside for how nutty it is. I think this is an extremely strong B+. Plus. Um, I, I might even go up to an A- minus on this. It is so big big for three mana. Let's go A- minus on Hunted Nightmare. Up next is Insatiable Hemophage. Insatiable Hemophage is three and a black for a creature Nightmare at Uncommon. It's a 3-3 three, three with Death Touch. Whenever this creature mutates, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life where X is the number of times this creature has mutated. Mutate for two and a black. 
very aggressively costed mutate cost here. You get a 3-3 death touch for three that drains one, perhaps more, depending on if this was not the first time that it has mutated. And then future mutates represent uh, even further life drain. The second or third mutate, by the time we get to a third mutate on this or with this, if this was the first, we're looking at six. So we're looking at a 12 point life swing. That's crazy. This card seems very good. Doesn't seem as powerful as the green of this cycle. Is this even a cycle? I don't know if this is a cycle. The green one that we'll talk about in a couple of days terrifies me, but this one seems very good as well. I think it's just a, a solid, solid B. I would happy, happily play every insatiable hemophage I can get my hands on. Up next is Lurking Deadeye. Lurking Deadeye is three and a black for a creature human assassin at common. It's a 4-2 with flash. When Lurking Deadeye enters the battlefield, destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. This is interesting and I'm having a really tough time rating it for some reason. It's a 4-2 four, for four with flash. So it's going to primarily act kind of like a uh, hired blade, hired blade, hidden blade, whatever it was in that set. Um, or a Hooded Assassin or Vraska's, whatever it was. We've seen this kind of effect before where it ETBs and it kills something that was dealt damage this turn. But it has kind of all of these effects put together, but you only really get to choose one, I think. If you're flashing this in before blocks, you're probably not killing anything with her ability. You're just going to be killing something by blocking with a 4-2 and presumably losing her. If you're flashing her in after combat, then you're just killing something. You're not getting the benefit of her in combat. It feels almost like you might use this a little bit more often on defense than anything else. You'll do your blocks. You'll deal some. You'll deal one to something. You'll not cast her as part of your blocks, and then you'll cast her at the end of your opponent's turn and finish off that thing that was dealt one damage or whatever by your I don't know your one four or your one six or or such. I think she's probably going to be fine. Four is not too overcosted here, but I will say this effect is often overvalued. It's often a little bit trickier than you think to really engineer this situation. Still, it happens and it's fine, but it is around like the. 20 second card level. So I'm just going to go with a C for Lurking Deadeye. Up next is Memory Leak. Memory Leak is two and a black for a sorcery at common and is the poster child of Magic Arena. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from that player's graveyard or hand and exile it cycling for one. So three mana for a Thoughtseize is not the worst thing in the world. It's also definitely not the best thing in the world. These are cards that I just typically don't play that much. Having cycling definitely makes it a bit better because if my opponent has nothing in their hand, which is obviously the worst place to be, or we're late in the game and I'm confident my opponent's just sitting on lands, then I can cycle away and turn this into something else. Still, that's going to keep it at the 23rd card level for me. I'm going to cut it when I can, play it when I have to, and that makes it a C. Up next is Mutual Destruction. Mutual Destruction is a single black mana for a sorcery at common. It has flash as long as you control a permanent with flash. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature, destroy target creature. So it's bone splinters that could be an instant. Will it be an instant? Well, there are only six creatures in the set below rare that have flash. And they are all in blue and black. One of them is blue black. Well, one's technically colorless, I suppose. Not technically, it literally is. So if you're blue black and if you have some of these flash creatures of which I think you only really want to be playing a couple of them, then this spell has instant speed and that's going to be pretty darn decent. If you don't, it's just bone splinters, which I always think is criminally underrated. Sacking a creature to kill the biggest, scariest thing your opponent has is always good. It is never bad. But obviously the downside is that it doesn't bring you back if you don't have a board state. So I think mutual destruction is solid. I think it's obviously below conditional or sorry, unconditional removal because you do have to have that creature to sacrifice. There's a couple of cool things. You could steal a creature and sack it, etc. So I'm going to put this at like a strong C plus. I think that's about where I put bone splinters as well. It's not amazing. You don't want to load up on these. You don't want a billion of them, but the first one is a strong C plus. Up next is Mythos of Nethroi. Mythos of Nethroi is two and a black for an instant at rare. Destroy target non-land permanent if it's a creature spell or if green-white was spent to cast this spell. I hate this card's text. It makes grammatical sense, but you have to think about it like three times to actually figure it out. It says destroy target non-land permanent if it's a creature. If you pay green-white, destroy target non-land permanent. So it's mono black creature removal or it's Abzan permanent removal. So keep that in mind. That's the easy way to think about this. 
yes, I get that this is grammatically correct. It makes sense, but it is miserable to read. There's not too much to say about this one. It is unconditional instant speed removal for three mana. It is a snap first pick. It's the third very good instant speed black removal that we've seen so far. Um, yeah, mutate's gonna, you're gonna have to be a little bit careful. I think mutate creatures are gonna die quite a bit. If you happen to be Abzan, it's cool. Maybe you get to kill an enchantment or something, but really you're just playing this for two and a black 99% of the time. Easy A, best removal in the set quite possibly. Just super, super good. Up next is Night Squad Commando. Night Squad Commando is 2 in black for a creature human soldier at common. She's a 2-3. When Night Squad Commando enters the battlefield, if you attack this turn, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. Eh, a 2-3 three for 3 with raid, and the raid is that it makes a 1-1. One, one. I'm not super stoked on that. If you happen to be going wide, which uh, it looks like I guess maybe the black-white deck could also be a go-wide human deck, then it kind of helps out, but it's still very filler level. I think there's just better stuff that you can get your hands on here. I think she's just a C in any and every deck. I think you play her if you just need a card. A C for Night Squad Commando. Up next is Serrated Scorpion. Serrated Scorpion is a single black mana for creature Scorpion at common. It's a 1-2. When Serrated Scorpion dies, it deals 2 damage to each opponent and you gain 2 life. So a 1-2 for 1 that when it dies gives me a, a little 4 point life swing. That's okay, but I'm never actually putting that in a deck. However, this is a fantastic uh, mutate platform. It comes down on turn one, which means I have now sort of ramped to all of those uh, mutate creatures that are cheaper on their mutate. The two and a white flyer, the, uh, the what was it, three and a black, whatever it was. Uh, all the ones that are cheaper, this just sort of acts as ramp. And then when that mutate creature dies and... I think mutate creatures are going to die a lot, I still get extra value out of that because this little ability is still going to trigger. So if you are mutating, this seems super fine. It seems like a C plus. I think that feels a little bit high just because this sucks if you top deck it. Um, so let's let's go strong C if you're going to use this as a mutate platform. If you're not going to be mutating on this, you just don't have that much mutate, you probably cut this most of the time. So strong C if you're going to use it for a serrated scorpion. Up next is Suffocating Fumes. Suffocating Fumes is two and black for an instant at common. Creatures your opponent's control get minus one, minus one until end of turn, cycling for two. I don't see too much of a reason to be giving your uh, opponent's creatures minus one, minus one till end of turn. It doesn't seem like it's that good of a deal. Instant speed is a nice little bonus there, um, but I still don't think it's enough for me to really want to play this. Cycling probably puts this into the play it if you have a spot section because, hey, maybe it comes up, maybe it kills something after combat or in combat or it saves a creature or something like that. And if that's just not coming together, well, turn it into another card. I think it's just a C, though. I'm not going to be looking to play Suffocating Fumes. Up next is Unbreakable Bond. Unbreakable Bond is four and a black for a sorcery at uncommon. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a lifelink counter on it. Five mana to go straight from graveyard to battlefield. Um, I always want to like this casting cost. We've seen this before. Getting a lifelink counter is nice, but you need to be getting stuff and relevant stuff into the graveyard. I think returning most three drops or less with this for five mana is just not going to feel good. So you need to be sure that you're returning something. This gets better the better your deck is. The more bombs you have, the more scary stuff you have, the more likely some of them are going to be in the graveyard, the more likely you're going to bring them back for, who knows, potentially even less mana by spending five mana. The worse your deck is or the more aggro you're your deck is the much less good this gets obviously its main home is black green where you're filling your graveyard up with other spells but you know th this is going to be a play it when you should play it kind of card when you should be playing it in black green when you have a whole bunch of scary things it's going to be fine it's going to be like a b minus um maybe even a c plus just because there's going to be those times where it's just a dead card and you can't even cycle it and then there are going to be decks where you should never even consider playing this up next is Unexpected Fangs. Unexpected Fangs is one and a black for an instant at common. Put a plus one, plus one counter and a lifelink counter on target creature. What? In a million years, I would have never predicted that this said lifelink. I would have predicted that this said death touch. It's a black card, Unexpected, unexpected Fangs. Sounds like something poisoning something. Why on earth does this give lifelink and not death touch? That's insane. Anyways, it's a meh combat trick. 
it's just a meh combat trick like giving something lifelink cool i don't want to spend an actual card on that i would much rather have a creature that does that for me or a creature that naturally has it getting a plus one plus one counter i guess this just doesn't excite me this is a very cuttable combat trick i'm going to put it at a c minus up next is Unlikely Aid. Unlikely Aid is one in a black for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus two plus oh and gains indestructible until end of turn. Another meh combat trick. It's going to save your creature and uh, hopefully kill theirs. That's okay, but that's a combat trick that kind of sits on the edge for me. If I've got a spot for it, I'll put it in. If I'm going to be aggro, I might put it in, but otherwise it's going to get cut. So it's a C minus as well. C minus for Unlikely Aid, which I feel like this must be a reprint, right? Yes. Yes, it was Gideon riding Rakdos. I remember that now. Up next is Void Beckoner. Void Beckoner is six black black for a creature nightmare horror at Uncommon. It's an 8-8 with Death Touch. Cycling for two and a black. When you cycle it, put a Death Touch counter on target creature you control. Eight mana is kind of insane. Uh, I would expect to never cast this. If you do cool you have an 8-8 with death touch for some reason that really doesn't matter if you're attacking you're probably killing whatever it's blocking or whatever is blocking it anyways if you're blocking with it you're probably killing whatever it is anyways the death touch is super irrelevant here um the death touch is there because it's part of this cycle two and a black to draw a card and put a death touch counter on target creature you control at instant speed i might point out is actually fine it's not exciting but it's fine. It's like a combat trick that, again, I think I would put it a C minus. The upside of if you happen to find yourself with eight mana and you happen to have this card in your hand, you surprise have an eight eight is enough of an upside for me to put this up to like a C. I still don't know if I'm going to go up to a C plus on it. Black doesn't really have the cycling payoffs and it's not really paired with the cycling payoffs. Yeah, I'm not going to go to a C plus on this. I think it's just a C. I think that casting cost is just too expensive that it's still going to be very rare that you're ever actually ever actually going to cast this perhaps it could be a good reanimation target and actually maybe that's the way i should be thinking about it you're going to pay two in a black 99 percent of the time cycle it and then you're going to reanimate it unbreakable bond would be a great way to get this back or um i guess no other ones we talked about today i don't think but some that we talk about later this week so perhaps that's the way to think about it if you're in that deck maybe this goes up to like a c plus i still don't think it goes any higher but let's go c plus in the right deck for void beckoner our second last card today is Whisper Squad. Whisper Squad is a single black mana for a creature human soldier. Again, art that looks a little bit off. Weird. Weird, weird, weird. I wonder what happened with the art here. We're starting to get different styles. Creature human soldier at common. It's a 1-1. One, one, pay one to black. Search your library for a card named Whisper Squad. Put it onto the battlefield. Tapped. Then shuffle your library. Big no. Big, 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 big no. Uh, I don't want to play a 1-1 one, one for 1. Um, again, they could technically be mutate platforms, but you can find better cards, play better cards. And getting multiples of these and getting there by getting some more 1-1s, one, I, no, I just, just no. I don't, I don't like this card. I think it's a trap. I think people are going to think that they got there and it's not going to do anything for them. So I'm going to put this at like a D. I don't want to ever play Whisper Squad. And our final card for today is Zagoth Mamba. Zagoth Mamba is a single black mana for a creature nightmare sp snake at uncommon. It's a 1 1. Whenever this creature mutates, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. It does not mutate naturally. You have to put something on this. That's the only way to get that trigger. And this is a very good mutate platform. It's a 1 1 for 1, so it's going to come down on 1, which means it's going to ramp you to all of those lower casting cost mutate creatures. And when you mutate onto it, you get a free dead weight for the turn solid card if you're mutating i think you are going to have to count up your mutate creatures you're going to have to have a threshold i, I imagine it's probably going to be around five or six if you have less than that you probably don't play zagoth mamba if you do have more than that if you are a mutate deck you're going to play zagoth mamba every single time so this is going to really really range in grade from like a c minus or even a d all the way up to like a b minus i think We'll see how powerful minus two minus two is. So let's go B minus for Zagoth Mamba in the right deck. So that's gonna wrap it up for black. Black looks pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I need to get my hands on a lot of these cards to really figure out how they're gonna go. I feel like I'm gonna lose a lot of games to Hunted Nightmare where it comes down on three and my I just didn't play a creature and I don't even get that death touch counter. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of removal which maybe will make this format not hurt as much. If there's a ton of removal, maybe it's less bomby but then i feel like the format is still just play a bomb and hope they don't have removal which is just a 
different kind of variance and a different outcome of still high variance. But we'll see how it goes. Let me know what you think of the cards in black, what you're excited to play, what you agree with, disagree with, etc. in the comments down below. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me over on Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. You can find me at patreon.com slash shamanaleek if you want to help out that way. Patrons definitely keep this channel going. You get access to the Discord where we talk about magic and other games and beer and food. You can work your way towards getting a Manaleek playmat. You get entered each week to get the cards out of the crack pack on Tuesdays, which I don't know what I'm going to do about a Korea because paper product doesn't exist in most of the world for a month. We'll figure something out maybe i hope but yeah the easiest way of course to help out is to like share and subscribe if you do have any questions comments or suggestions though let me know otherwise I'll see you all next time